Well, we're picking up here in uh, the Gospels with the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we did a little preview, which we covered some of that uh, explanation of the Gospels and talked about Mark's authorship. The, the author of Mark is, in, who in the book of Acts is called John Mark. And uh, it's interesting, he was the one that uh, uh, created some conflict between uh, Paul and Barnabas. And so we'll look at that a little bit when we get to the book of Acts. But Mark is the shortest gospel of the four gospels. About 93% of what's in Mark is also in Matthew or Luke. So Mark records, uh, uh, Mark records more of what Jesus did than what he said. He's you can see reflective in Mark's gospel. You'll see something if you read it, and it, you, if you're just paying attention, you'll find you'll see that he uses the word immediately, 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 like 40 times in the gospel. And it's like it's it's like uh, Mark's writing like the the biggest fan of Jesus that there is. He's like he's the leader of the fan club, you know. And uh, he's you just see immediately he did this, immediately he did this, and it's like he's just Jesus is his his hero, you know, a le legitimate superhero here we got. So um, uh, what we see is that Mark begins his gospel with an Old Testament quote. And it, it comes out of uh, uh, both Malachi and Isaiah. He mentions Isaiah. It says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. This is chapter 1, verse 2. Who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his, straights, his path straight. His path straight. And so uh, in verse 4, it's John the Baptist appeared. So what he's doing, he's giving an introduction, and he starts the whole gospel message with the, the appearance of John the Baptist. He doesn't start with the uh, uh, genealogy. He doesn't start like John does, of kind of a, uh, an overall view of the entire creation beginning. He starts with John the Baptist, comes on the scene, and there's, a, there's quotes from the Old Testament that actually gave, uh, gave a... Uh, description of John the Baptist, what he would be like when he came. So the launching point is for, for Mark is John the Baptist, and, is, and then it goes right to uh, a quick baptism of Jesus, and then a quick experience of Jesus in the wilderness. And so he flies right through those and gets into Jesus preaching. So when we get into uh, Mark 1, 14, it says, it tells us uh, here, it says, and after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. So we have this quick intro, John's on the scene, John introduces Jesus, Jesus gets baptized, Jesus goes to the wilderness, John gets cap is, is taken captive, and Jesus starts preaching. And we don't hear about John again until we get to like chapter 6, I think it is, 5 or 6. And uh, so what we have here is this quick intro and in sliding right into Jesus' ministry, and particularly his uh, healing, his preaching to the multitudes, the, the miracles that begin to take place. So in 115, it says, The time is fulfilled. This is Jesus' message. He begins preaching the gospel, and his message is, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. I mean, it's here. Repent and believe in the gospel. So that's Jesus' introduction. That's his message. And uh, then he begins to call his disciples uh, to himself, and, and he, uh, he, he, he has a famous quote in verse 17 of, He'll make them fishers of men. He'll make... You know, come to me because he was, he was recruiting a couple of fishermen. And he said, oh, well, I'll make you fishers of men. And so we, we see he goes uh, recruiting his disciples. And then it moves on to uh, Mark just describes all these miracles. That's mostly the, what Mark's going to talk about. We get to the end of the chapter in verses 44 and 45. And uh, he's just healed a, a, a man with leprosy. And he gets done healing him, and he tells him, don't tell anyone. So verse 44 says, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer your, for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. So he's instructing the leper to do what was given in order to be declared clean according to the law. And, but he says, don't tell anybody. Yeah, right. And so in verse 45, it says, But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news about to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in the unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. So Jesus wanted to go into the cities and preach in the synagogues, and he, he told this leper, don't tell anyone. Well, the leper goes out and tells everybody, and it's so much so that Jesus can't even get into the cities now. The crowds are so massive that he has to stay out in the unpopulated areas, and people have to come to him. And so yeah, that was part, I think, of the, the reason why he said don't tell anyone, one was to, to go and fulfill the law and go to the priests and do what, what was uh, you know, uh, right according to the law to be proclaimed clean. 
But the other thing is he wanted to get out there and get his message out. And right now, all of a sudden, he can't do that. He's got, to go, he's got to stay out in the countryside. So we go along. The Sabbath question comes up, which we see in the Gospels a lot. It comes up here recorded in Mark again and, and uh, throughout chapter 2 and beginning in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, the very first part, it says, verse 1, And he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath in order that they might accuse him. Isn't that something? You've got someone among you who's healing people. There's miracles going on, and all you're wanting to do is find some reason uh, to arrest him, to accuse him. And here it says in verse 3, And he said to the man with the withered hand, Rise and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. You know, uh, he was just saying, Can't we do good on the Sabbath? Wouldn't that be... When God looked favorably on that, and they just wouldn't even answer. And then verse 5, But after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. So what the Lord's seeing here is, you understand, this is the most incredible thing. We've got these incredible, incredible miracles going on, and all you're concerned about is, is somehow this isn't being done at the right time. He said to the man, after he looked at their hardness of heart, stretch out your hand. And that's what he, the guy couldn't do. He's got a withered arm. He can't stretch out his hand. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. In verse 6, And the Pharisees went out and immediately began taking counsel with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. It's, it's really one of the most remarkable passages in that you know, it shows you what blind jealousy and, uh, and hatred can do. It just covers up anything that's really going on that's good. I had a kind of a personal experience once where uh, I had some people that were very angry at me, and I was in a church, and... Uh, that night that they would express their anger, there was a woman came and she had a condition where she was coming in for emergency surgery uh, the next morning at a hospital and her, her bladder had fallen. And so me and her uh, mother, her, uh, me and her daughter actually prayed for her, the daughter prayed for her mother with me. And, uh, and the, you know, it was just a sweet presence of the Lord came. In fact, this first time I ever did this, I was in my early 30s and after I prayed for her, I just kind of reached over and kissed her on the forehead because it was just like, the Lord was just so present. The next morning, she went into the doctor. Uh, he said, uh, he looked at the, the x-rays, looked at her, examined her, said, there's nothing wrong with you, and sent her to someplace else. And what was amazing to me is that <clears throat> that night in, in one of the most remarkable miracles we ever had in that church, there were a lot of people, several people, that didn't see that at all because they were so angry, kind of mad at me. And uh, you could have good reasons to be mad at me, but, we, you know, doing that you miss what god's doing and that's what's happening here they're missing what god's doing because they think they're standing for god they think they're standing you know we're going to preserve the sabbath uh, you know and make sure the sabbath stays holy and that was certainly important in god's word is the sabbath stay holy but they didn't understand that the essence of the sabbath is is faith it's rest it's trusting in god to do god's work and god's work is healing the sick and raising the dead so so we see the word does get out. You know, even though Jesus had told people not to tell. Verse 9 of chapter 3, he says, And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the multitude, in order that he might not, they might not crowd him. For he had healed many, with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed about in order to touch him. So the, everyone's trying to get in close, and so he asked the disciples to get him a boat. And whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they would fall down before him and cry out, saying, you are the Son of God. And he earnestly, he earnestly warned them not to make him known. So what we find here is like the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, the leaders of the, the Jewish people can't figure out who he is, but the demons know. The demons are falling out, coming out of people crying out, you're the Son of God, and Jesus is telling them, be quiet. Don't make me known right now. He stops saying that kind of thing. And uh, it's, it's, so here's the, the conflict is, the, the most ungodly thing you can imagine, demonic spirits, know who Jesus is, and the people that are supposed to be leading the, the people in the most spiritual aspect of their life have no idea who he is. In fact, they want to kill the very one that's come to save them. And, uh, you know, part of that is just God's plan because as they kill him, it's going to be the provision for saving them. So that's where we left, leave off in chapter 3.